So in a lot of my videos, I've brought up Rupert Sheldrake's theory of morphic resonance. And I just realized that I've never actually done a video on the theory itself, which is interesting because I, I, use, I use it a lot. It, it actually provides a major part of my whole um, ontological framework uh, for, thinking, for thinking about uh, the world. Um, so in 1981, Rupert Sheldrake uh, published a book called The New Science of Life which is um, basically addresses the issue of morphogenesis, which is how organisms get their form. Um, and uh, what he started, what he started off with looking at was uh, protein folding, which is, uh, you know, protein chains, you know, have, they, they all, any given protein chain has a specific shape that it, that it takes, um, but there are a number of different shapes that it could take, you know, um, and, um, and yet, you know, and uh, you know, chemists are able to, the chemists are able to like unwind these chains, you know, to track them out, and then you know, in the laboratory, and then they, um, well, in the, uh, and then you know, if left alone, they'll end up taking their taking that form again, um, when there are a number of other combinations they could take. Uh, so he was wondering, you know, what, well, why is that? You know, a lot a traditional explanation is, you know, that they take you know, sort of the lowest entropy state that they can. Uh, but there's this thing called the multiple mi multiple minimum problem, which um, is that there are like millions of different uh, combinations. Like like there 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 are several different lo uh, lowest entropy states that they that they could take, uh, and yet they only take one. Um, and yeah, you know, it turns out that yeah, you know, the number of different combinations yeah, you know, you have to like, have an extremely advanced computer to be able to figure out you know all the different uh, shapes they could take even with that low entropy uh, requirement. So uh, what he proposed is that you know once the protein uh, chain takes a certain form, uh, then that kind of lays down a groove so that the so that the next time so that if it takes that form again, it will kind of build up this pattern. And each time it does it, it will become easier and easier for it to take that form. And um, and so then he, he applied this to uh, you know the morphogenesis of uh, of uh, organisms themselves, uh, and you know we tend to in the popular imagination we, we tend to like attribute everything about an organism to its uh, DNA. You know, we think that you know the DNA is the building blocks of life, and we think that you know in, in your in a, you know a DNA chain contains you know everything about you you know from you know, what your, what, from, you know, your various behaviors and habits and, uh, you know, to how, to, uh, what your body shape is going to be like. Um, and, uh, what, what I was going to say is that, uh, that's actually, uh, it's a, it's a, mis it's a mistake to think of that. Basically what building, what, what we do know about DNA is that codes for proteins. And so what it does, it, it's a vital, um, operation. It gives the building blocks of life. But you know, if you look at a house, and look at you know, if you look at a pile of bricks and, um, and a bunch of planks of wood and stuff, that that doesn't contain the plan for the house. That's the uh, the materials for building a house. You know, that it's you know what, what Aristotle called the called um, you know the the um, material cause, or um, where, whereas he's looking at the formal cause, the the actual plan for these. For his organisms, and he suggests that that's um, uh, that that is actually like created through um, morphic resonance. That once a form takes hold, it will become more likely to be repeated in the future. And so the idea is, that, you know, they they build up what's called a morphic field, which is sort of a probability field. It sort of constrains the probabilities within. It constrains the number of forms they can take within a sort of field of of different probabilities and. Um, the more something is repeated, the more constrained it will be. Um, and, uh, and and so it's, and so it's in the you know, animals, you know, take, take a certain take a certain form, and and then there's uh, this repetition that that narrows the field. Um, and so uh, and so what happens after that when you kind of develop this theory was he talks to people in other sciences and said, well, you know, this whole uh, you know, problem of form is not is not unique to biology. I mean, it's you know, it's a problem in chemistry with crystallization, uh, and 
you know, it's true. It turns out that when you um, synthesize a new chemical, um, it it becomes very hard. It's very hard to crystallize, um, and the but as you as you have repeated syntheses of, of this of this new chemical, like the, as the melting point rises, if I, if I recall correctly, so so it becomes easier and easier to crystallize. Um, and uh, so and so uh, what he would say, uh, and so he thought, well, either you're wrong, and you know, the you know this uh, problem of form isn't a problem, or it's a, or it's actually goes well beyond bio biology, and that's kind of what I went with, because um, he has this problem of chemistry, and the chemists uh, can't really explain that uh, that problem of crystallization either. Like I said, one, one of the common explanations is uh, the uh, is that the compounds are found in the, the the beards of migrant chemists and or, or in dust particles, one thing, and that, that makes it easier to synthesize each new time. Um, uh, but Yes. So, so we so we talk, so applies that to chemistry. Now, even so, you can even actually go back and apply it to the laws of nature itself. You know, and we have this idea. You know, going back to you know the, the ancient Greeks and, and their sort of idea of an eternal uh, realm. Uh, you know, the idea that we have these eternal laws of nature that are fixed and, and changing. Whereas uh, this this idea would. Um, it's just that said there are habits of nature that are built up over time, and the regularity that we see in uh, you know gravitational constants, uh, the speed of light, things like that, uh, is actually uh, due to you know the you know uh, you know numerous different repetitions, you know countless repetitions over over time, you know since the Big Bang, and that uh, and th therefore that's why they have the kind of regularity that they do. Uh, that they originally might not. Now, it's interesting that he uh, wasn't the first to propose this. Uh, this idea was actually proposed first by uh, the American philosopher C.S. Peirce, who, um, in, I guess, it was part of his attempts to overcome uh, uh, to overcome nominalism. But I, I can't really describe the log level of logical steps uh, that, that are involved in that. But uh, you'll take my word for it. Um, but and probably the most interesting uh, area for me uh, of this is memory. You know, I'm not talking about you know sort of objective uh, uh, qualities about uh, you know form, but you know there's it also applies to subjective states. And actually, uh, Sheldrake is also not the first person to uh, talk about it in terms of memory either. Um, there was uh, a French philosopher named Henri Bergson who wrote a book called Matter of Memory, which I actually read before I started reading re Sheldrake's books. And it was actually through him that I got interested in Sheldrake. Um, so um, the, idea, the idea is that, you know, neuroscientists have been studying the brain for a long time. And, uh, and as far as memory goes, they have uh, a really good understanding about, you know, the neural correlates involved in forming a memory and in retrieving a memory but what happens in between is still you know very much a mystery we still have not found you know material traces of memories in the brain uh, and, and, and it kind of if you think about it logically it, it's, it becomes part of uh, it's really hard because you know when we're trying to recall memory yeah you know, how does uh, what part of the brain remembers where the material what material trace you're trying to uh, Kind of recall, and, and then you have, have, have to have another material trace that finds that material trace, so it's, it becomes like an infinite regress. So, what that just instead is that um, the past is not is present in a sense, uh, the uh, and it's something that you can actually perceive. So, you know, when so there's an interesting thing that happens with the memory recall is that when you're uh, when you're recalling a memory. The same uh, neuron uh, neural pattern that was associated with the original memory ends up firing again. So you get the same. So it it, it becomes the brain pattern can kind of repeats from what the original memory was like, and so in a sense you're perceiving the memory. Yeah, you know, where you're perceiving it from. Well, the idea is that the memory, you know, the, the past is still there. That that's that experiential past is is always still present. And the difference between past and present is 
simply one uh, that one is causally open, namely the, the present is causally open in which in which you can act upon it, whereas the past is causally closed. You can't change the past, although you can certainly you know, reimagine what it might have been like. But um, but the idea is that when you're recalling memory, you're perceiving the past, and of course it's you know memory is fallible, and so you know that, it, but so is perception too. So yeah, you're you know, fallibly trying to uh, recall a past by perceiving it as best you can. Now that's that's one form of memory. And you know, then there's also like memorization, like when you're sitting for a test. And you know, with that one, you're uh, like writing down uh, you know, think things from the textbook, you know, re uh, going over your notes, you know, reading them, reciting them. Uh, you're doing all these things and repeating them in a number, number of different ways that you sort of dissociate from uh, you know, an actual memory in the sense I just described, and more in in terms of where it becomes like an established uh, piece of data that you can that you can use uh, for you know for finishing your tests and for recalling it later. Uh, so so there's a kind of so through repetition it becomes a, a kind of field in your in your, in your mind, um, and then and of course it's also kind of uh, it, there's another kind of memory which is kind of like know-how. Like I've played guitar for 15 years, uh, and that and you know that has been you know a matter of you know training myself. It, it's it's interesting because that that kind of memory isn't just mental. You know, yeah, there's actually you know muscle memory where I've had to train my fingers to you know behave in a way that they might not uh, you know normally behave and get get accustomed to a fretboard and learn you know where the scales are and, and everything. So I mean there's um, and 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 so you know that's the repetition that you uh, that that's groove is laid down, and so what's really interesting with that is you know we have our individual memories. Oh, uh, I, sh I should probably mention. So the idea is, yeah, how do so how do we access these memories? How do we uh, you know access these forms? And it, and it is that you know since repetition is. Um, Kind of how these grooves are laid down, then repeating a physical pattern can tune into a motoric field, like a radio tuner tuning into a station. So, um, the, so the idea is that you know when you're recalling memory, you know, and you're using the same sort of neural pattern, uh, you know, in recalling a memory that was used in uh, creating the memory in the first place, then what you're doing is essentially tuning into that memory. Um, and similar, you know, obviously DNA does play a role in uh, inheritance traits. But you know, in a, in a sense, the the number of traits associated with a single um, a single chromosomal pair, of, for instance, is, you know, is um, vastly greater than we could you know explain from from just that from just the protein alone. And the idea is that you know that protein has been associated has been correlated with um, you know certain traits, and so you get that that, that uh, protein, and it tunes into this certain set of traits. Like in flies, they have they've uh, done experiments where they change like a single protein, and then instead of you know, where their antenna would normally be, they grow another set of legs. Now is now somehow especially that that one protein has the, the entire plan for you know these legs, which are you know. Actually, you know, a very complex phenomenon. You know, and the idea is that, well, in a sense, yes, because that that protein has been associated with this uh, with this form through yeah you know, through association. That the, the correlation has been repeated over and over again, so that uh, you know when you make switch that one thing, it drastically switches programs, so to speak. Um, so you know. So one interesting thing is when you look at yeah, morphic resonance on a collective level, uh, you know, I talked about, you know, we have our individual morphic field about our own youth, our own memories, our own form and such. But, you know, that's also a subset of the collective morphic field of humanity, of mammals, of, you know, the animal kingdom and, you know, branching out, etc. So um, this kind of uh, dovetails with Carl Jung's idea of the collective unconscious. So there is this, you know, collective memory of humanity that has built up over, you know, the over you know millions of years of evolution, and um, and what, what's interesting, this is actually kind of it 
uh, throws an interesting little perspective on the whole nature versus nurture debate, because you know that, that means you know we have like you know, this this idea of like instinct or human nature that we're you know naturally a certain way versus you know cons you know the the constructivist view of, of uh, human behavior where everything is socially constructed and what this would suggest that that's actually a matter of degree rather than of kind that there aren't certain behaviors that are like uh, you know coded into our DNA while others are you know part of part of social adaptation rather you know sort of the more ingrained behaviors have simply been repeated more times and therefore uh, you know, have a deeper resonance than more recent behaviors you know, those associated like with civilization uh, but they but those still have a kind of groove in so uh, have a certain degree of innateness even though we could overcome them um, and I think that has all kinds of interesting sociological implications as well um, as another thing about this is that it's um, in talking about you know form and things in terms of field phenomena, first of all, it's interesting that he's bring back the idea of formal cause, which Aristotle talked about, but has been kind of abandoned since Descartes tried to overcome the Aristotelian science of of, um, of, of the scholastics. Um, yeah, and and uh, it, it's also you know the, this field phenomena is, is actually kind of uh, pushing away from uh, mechanistic science. You know, and uh, I, know, I remember a conference report once challenged, challenged me on the whole you know, idea of you know, what, it, what does it mean to have a mechanistic view of the world. But I, I think, you know, and, and he talks about you know, all the different things the machine can be. Well, I think field phenomena are hard to fit into a mechanistic view, I think. I mean, certainly, you know, some, some machines you know, can use fields or generate fields. I mean, electromagnetic fields have been known about for a long time, and certainly we have magnets. You know, and how do they work? But, but um, uh, but you know, it, it's but the idea is, you know, a field does not behave much like a machine. It, it's it's actually um, it's it's a structure that that kind of you know, you know surround is related to the physical form, in a, a mechanical form, but uh, you know, in, in sort of uh, de determines the uh, the range of possibilities for it, but but is not confined to it. Um, and uh, another interesting thing about like you know we have like you know as I said um, like you know electromagnetic fields, and there's you know quantum phenomena that are that really the field phenomena. You have quantum field theory, you know, and now you know. Theoretical physicists are trying to work for work toward a unified field theory, you know, that will explain everything in terms of fields. And I think actually um, morphic resonance kind of provides an interesting framework for you know explaining the very large and very small in terms of fields. Because uh, one thing about morphic fields is it's 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 a nested hierarchy. Was sort of you know I have a morphic field as a person. I have cells that have their own morphic field. Um, the cells have proteins that have their own morphic field, and, et cetera. So there's all these there's um, this organizations. Yeah, what Arthur what Arthur Kessler called holons. So there's this holarchy of of, of you know nested uh, morphic fields uh, within each other. Um, and uh, and and so that and that way you can have you know the morphic fields of you know at all these different scales. Uh, you know. And I think work towards a more unified field, uh, uh, understanding of nature. Um, now, critics have dismissed uh, morphic resonance as mysticism or magic. And, um, I have I've seen very few like serious attempts to refute morphic resonance. I think you know, most of the critics I've seen uh, basically just badmouth it, and you know, uh, it, 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 almost everything I've seen is just dismissive. Um, and I think, like, there's there's something very dangerous to the sort of uh, mechanistic, uh, you know, materialistic worldview in in morphic fields. I mean, first of all, it's not really material in ter the traditional sense. Um, it, it also opens up all kinds of possibilities that um, mainstream science is kind of scared of, like, um, 
for example, the idea of the soul. You know, traditionally the idea of the soul, you know, that we think of is it's this unchanging essence that you know underlies all of us. And if you will say that you know neuroscience has refuted the soul, well, but if you're but if you have a morphic field that includes you know all the you know the cumulative form and cumulative memory of of, of an organism, that kind of does sound like a soul, isn't it? I mean, it's sort of it's a field that is that is accumulated over time that contains you know all these things about you that have uh, existed over time. And, and so having this cumulative morphic field allows for sort of an evolutionary idea of the soul. And, um, you know, if your memories are not you know, material traces in the brain, but in, but in fact a buildup of a field, then, then it raises the question you know, of can those memories be accessed as something after, your, after the physical death of your body? You know, and... Um, yeah, you know, uh, and, and somehow survive the death of the body, and uh, you know, uh, Sheldrake leaves that as open question. I mean, the, the, yes, the the memories persist, but you know, can they be tuned into by something that is beyond your physical body? You know, it's he, he leaves the possibility open, but doesn't answer that question, and that's kind of how I feel. I think I think it's not something like we can readily say, but um, but it does leave that possibility open. Um, he also, Sheldrake has also uh, you know, studied um, psi phenomena, telepathy, clairvoyance, things like that. Um, and you know, one thing he's uh, discovered is that, that you know telepathy seems to be stronger between people who know each other, you know, family members, close friends, lovers, things like that. Um, and so you know, the idea is that your your social relation with that person has a morphic field. You know, any any relation. Will end up, you know, building a uh, you know, when it, over time will build up this morphic field, and you know, the, the idea is that you will have a uh, mental connection with that person, and uh, and and thus, you know, you know, study like telephone telepathy, like you know, like you know when a person's calling, and these then controlled experiments where, you know, you, you choose a set of friends, and you know, when one of them is chosen at random, and you get, and the results are. Yeah, not perfect, but uh, very uh, statistically significant. Um, so anyway, I don't, I'm not gonna get too far into that, but yeah, you know, that's not, it. It opens up all kinds of different possibilities, way more than I can go into. Um, and as far as you know, you know, like evidence for morphic fields, um, there's a lot to go into, and I and I'll I'll, just, I'll link to a uh, video of one of his lectures where he goes over that evidence if you want to watch it. Um, I will bring up one thing that I uh, came across recently, which uh, Rupert Sheldrake doesn't mention, um, uh, but I think is actually very indicative of morphic resonance. Uh, they studied uh, what's called the nematode, the nematode worm, a uh, very small worm, or actually maybe, maybe it was a oh, flatworm, or round, round worm, sorry. Okay, that, that's the one. Okay. Round worm, I think it was, that uh, when you, you can decapitate this worm and it will grow a new head, you know, and that's and yeah, the head you know contains the brain of this organism, and um, found that the memories of this organism continue to uh, persist uh, with with this new uh, regenerated head. Um, uh, you know, like they've they've taught it behaviors, and these learned behaviors that it, that it learned before its head was decapitated are continue to be repeated after the head has been regrown. So. Uh, that that's very hard to explain in terms of you know a sort of neural theory of con uh, of uh, memory, but uh, it fits in perfectly with morphic resonance. So uh, I think I've gone on for long enough now. Um, hope you enjoyed. Peace.